children of peace. B'nai Shalom, on Yeshua will feast. B'nai Shalom, children of peace. B'nai Love one another as you have seen me love you. My sister, my brother, do as I, I command you and come on. I'll give you peace Then you will be B'nai Shalom B'nai Shalom Children of peace B'nai Shalom On Yeshua will Brothers and sisters, welcome to the Torah Institute. My name is Mark Davidson and today we're doing a very special biographical show on two people who have been used remarkably over the last 30 years in bringing the truth to so many homes across the globe. They have been pioneers in the Messianic movement and in particular the way of the Nazarene. Writing books, leading seminars and teaching from the highways and byways wherever they may find themselves. And despite great adversity and pressure, they are still pushing forward, hearing Yahushua's voice and pleading with his followers to come together and love one another. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege today to be chatting with Lou and Phyllis White. How are you guys? We're fine. Hi. Hello. Good to see you. So today, I, I think everybody would just like to hear how you came into this, where you met each other. Just a lovely story of Yahushua's love in your life. So where did, where did you both grow up? Well, in the same city. Louis, uh, we, Louisville, in, Kentucky. Louisville, Kentucky. And well, that's where we're at now. And, uh, you know, in the, we're scattered. You know, we're here. Anyway, the, uh, the way I met Phyllis was I'd been going to high school, and uh, I started my musical career at basically at age 11. And that drew me to her because, see, we were linked through the study of music. It was, uh, I was in fifth grade and I saw somebody that was amazing that had played in front of the group and my, my friend Bob, you know, at, the, at my business, was a fifth grader with me and we watched these two brothers playing guitar who were our classmates and we were absolutely amazed. So Bob and I started to take guitar lessons at age 11. And then I was, uh, you know, pretty proficient with it. I was very dedicated. I practiced a lot. And uh, Bob did as well. And by the age of 12, we were both pretty proficient. We had just a year under our belt. And we started to play in little folk bands. And we were playing for the, high, the, the grade school that we were in. And the, uh, you know, and then by the time we uh, got to be, oh... I was, take, I was taking formal lessons, as, as was Bob. And then Phyllis came in after I became a, a teacher, and she was 16 and I was 17. You want to tell the story from there? 
Oh, I don't know. I was I begged my parents for guitar lessons because I thought that's what I wanted to do, and I walked into the conservatory of music and then was waiting for my guitar teacher to come out, and then I saw this most wonderful, beautiful, handsome boy I ever saw in my life. <laughs> I mean, it was just like there was just fireworks going off, and I was so nervous. I, I didn't... I didn't get much of a guitar lesson that day, but anyway, it's it was just wonderful. Mm. Um, but then we got separated because he had to go into the service, and we s sort of wrote back. I, I kept all his letters while he was in the Air Force, and um, I still get him out and read them. <laughs> yeah, I was in for four years. Yeah, we only knew each other for a year, and then or so, and. And I took her to a few band gigs, you know, that we had. And, you know, we were really into each other. I was too busy to date very many girls. I had dated one other girl, and that was it. And then, but even she only went to a band gig. It wasn't a real date, you know. But, uh, you know, Bob and I were really dedicated musicians. And then uh, I, I'd disappear into the Air Force for four years going here and there. And then I got out of the Air Force, and the first day, that I came home, there was a letter, and it was from Phyllis, saying, welcome home. And then it was basically, we, you know, got together and we said, well, yeah, let's get married, and we did. And uh, then we, st well, we were starting college, and uh, basically we both went to college mm -hmm. after work. I got a job at a financial institution. She was working at, a, at the phone company and um, in the offices as an engineer and or not at first but she got into the engineering department and we were both eventually working in the same building <laughs> yes. uh, I was working for a bank and she was working upstairs or downstairs I, I think that was, it was after, upstairs. that was after we got married yeah after yeah. we were married a long after yeah. and for some almost 10 years we were not even thinking yeah. about children but then the children come along when I'm 31 she's 30 the first child and uh, from there, you know, we just found out what life was really about, you know. <laughs> because we went to school for like seven years. We both graduated from college. But when we finished our college, then we were wondering, why haven't we had any children? And we took preliminary testing to see, mm -hmm. you know, and we just basically gave up on children. Then suddenly I got pregnant. One. And then what, honey? Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, we were, you know, we weren't unbelievers, but, you know, we were just not dedicated to anything. I had never read scripture because I'd been raised in Catholicism. And I, mm -hmm. by the time I was 18, I was kind of over that. Not that I didn't believe, I just, I was very, very programmed. You know, I had a lot of their teaching still in my head. And I had been raised in Baptist, Baptist. beliefs and yeah. had been baptized in mm -hmm. the name of Jet Yeshuas and and I had and I I had strong beliefs, but pretty much like him, we were both just kind of living for ourselves, mm -hmm. weren't selfish, we? yeah, just, just like everybody, yeah. you know, try, trying to get a get just trying ahead. to just trying to make it a living. And, uh, and then when well, the next thing that happened was. Uh, we started to grow apart a, a bit because of the fact that I was working all the time, you know, trying to build, you know, the business up, changing displays, just working all the time as much as I could. And then, of course, our firstborn uh, was the only child we had at that time, was getting to be about, well, four years old or so. And um, one night I was reading him a, a book or reading him a story as he went to sleep. And he looked over at, uh, at the other wall, and he said, he was looking at a Christmas tree. And he said, Dad, what is that? It was beautiful. And I looked at the thing myself. It was the only light on in the room. And I said, you know, I don't really know what that is. But I've seen it all my life. But I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll find out what it is. And when I do, I'll let you know. And uh, by the way, I'm never going to lie to you. I told him, I said, I'm going to find out what things are. And, you know, and it was a couple of, well, a, a year, another year later or so, Phyllis had been going to a, a, a study, right? With Wilhelmina? Yes, we, we were, 
Wilhelmina was a Christian friend of mine that worked with you. that worked at South Central Bell, and but she was keeping the fact hidden that she knew his name, but she didn't share that with just everybody. And she was having Christian group studies where we studied scripture, and one day, the study had dwindled down to just me and her and one one other person, and she said, "Well, I'm going to share something with you." that I don't tell everybody and she told us his true name and and what I, name was that she actually she was saying Yeshua. Yeshua you know that that was you know my first understanding was Yeshua and she also explained to me about how terrible Halloween was she was crying it was everybody at work was dressed up in costume I think I was too I don't remember if I was or not but she was actually crying because she said if you only knew the nature of our Creator and that's when she told me his name Yahweh and Yeshua and she said if you only knew his nature and his commandments and what he's he's taught us not not to do you would know how we were hurting him and she went through the scriptures where it talked about not to pursue him in the ways of these pagan ways at that point Lou wasn't even at the level of Christianity as far as reading scripture or anything and Wilhelmina and I were praying for him day after day mm -hmm. you said at one point to Amy a few weeks ago, you uh, your relationship had pretty much it, it was gone. You you'd had it. You were asking for a new husband. <laughs> that was right when our relationship was not good. It was I, at the bottom. Yeah. And and I told Wilhelmina, I hated him. I wanted another husband, and she said, "Wait a minute. You can't hate your husband. You have to. He's your husband." You have to love him as you would Yeshua, you know. And she she was a Yahusha, and she said, you have to love him as Yahusha because he is your head. And I said, oh, but I can't love him. She says, well, if you can't love him, then you love your enemies. If he's your enemy, then you have to love him. So there wasn't any way I was going to get out of loving my husband, whether he was my enemy or whether he was my head. And she just was holding me down with that scripture. And, you know, I know she was praying. And so one day I, I, I asked Yahushua, I said, Father, I need a new husband. For, I need a new husband for me and a fa someone that will be a father to my son. And he told me that if I would humble myself and be submissive to my husband, the one that he gave me to be my husband, that he would give me a new husband. It didn't make any sense to me, I, but I did it. Mm -hmm. I just stepped out in faith, and I started to be... And how did that affect you when you saw me being submissive to you? I was and amazed. Obedient? Uh, it, it, it was uh, the very thing that men need is the support and encouragement and somebody to stand behind them instead of resisting them. And when I saw that happening, um, then I started to change. And, you know, and of course she was praying for me too, but Yahushua was softening my heart and I was opening up to her because of this. And it's reflective, you know, because when one person is kind, the other person eventually has to be kind as well. I didn't know that I was being unkind, but it was more or less more of an ignoring kind of relationship. I was just so busy and preoccupied that she was perceiving it a different way. And women think differently than men and feel differently. And they need things that men don't need, but men are very insecure creatures, you know. We don't like to show <laughs> that, but we really are. And when we get the support and encouragement and love and dedication from our wives, then it just opens up a whole new world for our you know, perceptions. So that was happening. So all these scriptures and that I had you, never read or I found later I were what she was doing. What did you find you know? to read? Oh, she put something in my path that was a copy of the scriptures that I had never read any of. I was about 35 years old, and I opened up the, this big book into the middle, and I saw this this writing, and I remember it was on the right-hand side of the page, 
it was uh, Isaiah, we know his name is Yeshayahu, but chapter 53. And this really split the universe wide open for me. I thought the book was talking to me. Because <laughs> see, I'd been studying science and that was, and I had just given up on it because I, I was just so frustrated with it. And then I closed the book up and I said, I've got to read every word of this. Now it was the NIV and I was, you know, unaware of the translations. But I opened it up to the preface, read the preface, and some paragraphs down I saw that they had removed the name. You're getting ahead but of yourself. I'm ahead of myself because when I first saw the copy of the book, there was something laying on top of it. And I thought, wait a minute, this is important. We can't have things sitting on top of this. So I ripped it off and I felt this rage burning in me. And I was going, what's that? You know, because of this thing that was sitting on top of his word. And then he op he had me open it up to the preface, and I read the preface. No, you're getting ahead of yourself. I am? What did I you, do? You found in Isaiah that says, he, I hate divorce. Oh, I saw that too. That, that was in another place. That was place. because he's asking about our relationship. Yeah, that was in another place, though. He, you, you found out but that he hates yes, divorce. Yes, I read, I would start after, that was after I started reading more scripture. Okay. I found out that I, I was asking everybody whether, you know, because we were talking about getting divorced. And the word, you know, divorce shouldn't have even been in our vocabulary, but it was. And we were, and I was asking people, and everybody said, "Yes, you should just get divorced." And I said, "Well, there's one person I haven't asked," and I asked Yahua. So I searched in His Word, and I found out that He hates divorce. And I and I had already received, an, an, you know, a partial filling. You know, even before I was, you know. Okay, so was that before you found you found that in the preface yes. first? See, yeah. I'm sorry. See, the first thing I'm that happened to me. I'm learning this for the first time. The first time. thing that happened to me in the same scene when I was first reading Yeshua 53, I saw that and I said, I know him. You know, I have always known him. And I w went to the preface and then he introduced himself to me because he, he showed me his name had been removed by these translators and then my my bones started to feel heat in them. And a rage started to burn in me over that. I was going, who do they think they are? And I, then that was the beginning. So everything I read from that point on, I had the, the key and I put the key in and it was all open to me. And then I saw the footnotes and I was seeing how the footnotes were fighting against what was above them in the text. And I was going, wow, what in the, what in the world has happened? It, but it was what I found out later was it was the replacement theology and all of the things that the, the circus fathers had changed people's minds and thinking on. I didn't know all that. All I knew was there was this war going on between the footnotes and the text. And that was the beginning. But I knew the truth and I was going to trust what the text said rather than what these men had written. You know, because they were looking like fools down there. You know the stuff that they were saying. I was going. That can't be. You can't say this. And he, the creator, says one thing, and then they say something else. And it was just. And I was led to all these scriptures, where he said, "I am Yahuwah, and I do not change." And I'm going. Well, I'm glad of that. You know. <laughs> and all these texts. You know. And like I have. You know. Like Acts four twelve just jumped out at me. You know, blazed in my mind because I had the key. Because, see, the word name meant something to me, you know. And uh, she's responsible for praying for me, you know. Well, and that was it. Yahuwah put Wilhelmina yeah, in our path. That's true. And I, I'm forever thankful yeah. to him for doing that. She's yeah. probably passed away by now. We lost t touch with each other. Yeah, we were very young. We were in our 20s, um, no, 30s. 30s. Yeah, maybe early 30s, yeah, by yeah. that time. Yeah, because because so. Michael was already. Mm -hmm. In fact, Adam was about to be born. Okay. Yeah. Um, there was. Well, actually, Adam was the result of a reconciliation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We he we that New Year's even even though I was still trying to be submissive, the things still were kind of rocky, and he went to to watch a movie with his brothers. It was. New Year's Eve. We were still celebrating the pagan day, the pagan things then. 
And he came home New Year's Eve that night, and Michael and I were still up, and and he said, we've got to watch this movie, and we've, you know, the what the movie was was, was just about families staying together. And he he took me in his arms and said, we're, we need to make it work. And yeah. then, then from that day on, everything, you know, and then he blessed us with an, another child after mm-hmm. waiting six and a half years. And, um, and then, then when did we get immersed in the true name? How did you, how did you learn, tell them how you learned the real name. Well, uh, first of all, I want to bring up one other little detail, though. When you were talking about the, um, the fact that we were getting back together, uh, the real thing that happened to me was it dawned on me that there was a, a, a real spiritual enemy that was trying to divide up the marriages, not just ours, but all marriages, mm-hmm. and that he hated marriage. And that this thing that was, we call him, well, it was some demonic spirit that was causing us to be divided. I said, we've got to stand back to back and be opposed mm-hmm. to that force. That's what she said. And that was it. I knew that we were being, mm-hmm. we were under attack. And it wasn't something we could see. It wasn't even us. It was something outside of us. And I said, that's what we have to be united on, is this force, this, uh, yeah, this like the Star Wars thing. It's this <laughs> evil force. Yeah. And it's forces, really, the principalities and powers. But uh, back to that other part, how did I get immersed? Uh, how did now, I how did you this? learn the name? I, I, You know, it's been a while. Well, we... I, I was very interested in the name from the very beginning, the very first day I opened the scriptures. So I went to the University of Louisville, where I'd gone to college for seven and a half years, and I went and photographed every alphabet that I, that was related to Hebrew. And, of course, it you know involved uh, alphabets. Of he means in his head. He's got a photographic memory. Yeah. He doesn't mean with a camera. He means oh, I was photocopying it. Were too. you? Oh, yeah, oh yeah. okay. I'm I was, sorry. I was studying it in, intensely. And I saw all this ancient script and all this modern Hebrew. And then I started looking at the Greek and I started seeing problems. And I, I'm just, I'm still learning things. There's new things to discover in the transitions. But uh, the name and its um, correct transliteration was important to me. I didn't even know the difference between a translation and a transliteration until I started doing the deeper research. But uh, then it dawned on me that I need to get immersed because of the text that I was writing, I mean reading and studying. And the more scripture I, I saw about his name, which involved immersion and so forth, then I went and got immersed, you know. And uh, I was bringing Phyllis along with, with my new understandings. And she was pretty well, everything I said that, that Scripture said, she went along with. So Yahushua was in her heart. And it was resistance at first, but saying, well, if it says it, we've got to do that. you know. And that's what we did, but, both of us. But, you know, because Yahuwah had prepared my heart to be submissive to my husband, prepared me to accept this new trend, this new mm-hmm. learning. Because I was being submissive, I was able to receive the blessing also. And and that's when I got my new husband. Yeah. When I was immersed, though, the old husband died. Yeah. What was the reaction to the assembly that you were currently in? We continued to go there for a, a while. Oh, yeah, that's a story, too. We, yes, it We was. kept going back, knowing the truth. Mm-hmm. And then what? And and we weren't able to have much effect on them at that time. And then then you went and had a talk with our pastor. Yeah, we were seeing people and talking to people and saying, "It's this. It's this. It's this. This is the, this is what it really says." And that they've changed the words and so forth. You know, just like Scripture says they would do. And uh, you know, so I had to go to my pastor and I made an appointment to see him. And this was one of those huge assemblies. You know, there were. 6,000 people there now. And I think there's closer to 30 there 30, now. 30,000, yeah. But they're now. right down the street from Torah Institute. It's like it's like Goliath <laughs> and Daoud. I mean, you got this huge place and this itsy bitsy little place. And uh, we've got the name. And like like Daoud mm-hmm. came to Goliath. I come to you in the name of Yahuwah, of, of armies. 
you know, in love, of course. And anyway, we'd tell people the, the things and they would just, the stuff would, they'd get this stone face and then this resistance and, then, you know, they'd freeze and they just resisted. You know, it was amazing. Well, when I went to talk to the pastor at this assembly, I talked to him and at the end, after an hour of me back and forth with him and I'm trying to persuade him of what, why we're not doing the things that it says that we're supposed to do. And he says, well, and I called the, the whole building a synagogue and that really upset him. He got enraged over that. And I said, well, this is a beautiful synagogue, you know. And of course, I thought at that time, synagogues were buildings. The, synagogue, the congregation is the synagogue, you know. But uh, I didn't know that. But neither did he, and he may still not know that. But uh, he was, a, a, you know, a, a good intended man. He had good intentions, but he, uh, he didn't sit very well with it. But uh, at the end of the discussion, he said, then can we at least say that we're brothers? And I said, well, I'm going to have to study on that because I'm not really quite sure we are brothers. You know, because I'm thinking one thing and doing, another, and doing something that you don't do when I love the commandments and you don't apparently want to keep all of the commandments. You know, you want to pick and choose which ones you like because of the way you're taught. And I like them the way they're written. But they're not hard, you know. All you have to do is just, you know, acknowledge them and say, well, I'm not doing that. Let me just do that. So, anyway, the next week, he started a men's study group yeah. on Sabbath morning. And I didn't have a problem with that. I was going, just, well, just maybe I had immediately. an effect on It was immediate. You know, it was like, he did, He did. maybe he saw some slippage there, possible. <laughs> and so he's, he wants to cover both. But he was there, and he was directing it, too. And uh, I was in the uh, in the audience there. Yeah, you went to a couple of those. I meetings. went to a couple of them until I got to the word studying, and and I just uh, couldn't see any reason why I had to even be there. And, you know? and and I was going to a little splinter group. I, you know, we well we had quit attending services there because one day Lou asked me, he says, "What do you think? Can we have our feet on both sides of the fence?" We've got to make a decision. You want to keep going back here where they're, what, profaning the name. You know, they were singing praise to his name, but they would never say his yeah. what his name was. And so we both decided to quit going, but I was still involved in the splinter group. And I was witnessing to to this lady in this group, and she, and I was giving her a, a copy of Fossilized Customs. That was the first edition. And she took it back to that same pastor and ask him about it, and he says, oh, you can't have anything to do with Lou White. I don't want any of, any of my people or anybody that come here to have anything or talk to Lou White. Hmm. She came back and told me at the next time we had a meeting, she says, I can't talk to you or your husband or have anything to do with anything he's written. And how, how could that possibly be? Anyway, the, it is dangerous to, for pastors because of the fact that the, the flock will have their strongholds rele released as they learn the truth. Because when you learn truth, the strongholds are just dissolved away because they're overcome. Not that I'm doing it. It's just the truth. It's scripture that does it. Do you still have the same uh, belief in you about what you would call a brother? When your pastor asked you, uh, are we still brothers? Not that he's an enemy at all, or anyone like him is an enemy, but they're outside the covenant, and therefore they're not really engrafted. That's the only distinction. They can be potential brothers, but they may be at the point that, that they're making the decision to obey or not. That's the point where we can help them over and say, well, Let's love the commandments. Let's ex receive a love for the commandments, which is only possible by the spirit of Messiah. Yahushua will come into a person and enable them to accept the truth, you know, and then teach them more truth and more truth and, and fill them more with his spirit all the time. But, uh, you know, when they're not, when they're resisting, they're not technically brothers, but we're to treat them as if they are, you know, draw them with love not contempt and judgment and 
all the things that we see uh, happening between the Nazarene even. You know, you're not keeping this, this letter has to be there, or <laughs> you're a liar, or whatever, all that. That's wrong, you know. Those are all people at different stages of understanding and development. That's what that is. But if they're Sabbath keeping and they want to keep the commandments and they, they, they have an understanding of the name and they love the name and so forth, even if it's not exactly like another, then they're still brothers and sisters. But the, the, this backbiting is not right, you know. They're just on, in the race, you know. So uh, explain where the seed thought for searching for the truth as far as fossilized customs came from. You mentioned your younger son, Michael. Well, most parents would have looked over at the tree and said, that's a Christmas tree. It's Christmas time, that's a Christmas tree. <laughs> but you said, I don't know, son. Go, go there. Where, where did that seed thought come from to, I have to find oh, this? Oh, boy. Well. Because there's a lot of questions about whether you actually wrote this book. So tell us how you came to you. Yes. Well, I was in before I was in immersed in scripture, I was in science. And I started to do fringe science. And I was doing things that I shouldn't have been doing. And that involved the mental processes of what we call flying. And that flying is where you're usually in a trance or you're going to sleep. And I had no training in this. I was just being drawn into it probably by demonic powers. And I went to places in my, I was in, on my bed, and I would pretend to be taking off in an airplane, in my mind. And then the airplane would go away. And then I would project myself out into the deepest regions of space. And when I got there, I saw no stars, but I saw infinity. The outer darkness is what it is, I know now. And that was, uh, a pretty miserable feeling. I didn't see my body. All I was was basically a blob of energy, a little jelly bean or something. And all I saw was nothing in all directions. And all I could do was will myself to turn, but there was nothing to turn to. There was no orientation. This was outer darkness. And uh, I was out of body, okay? And Yahusha came to me at that point. And all I saw was a pillar of light. I'd never read about this, but I saw the Shekinah, and it was a beautiful thing. It had no top, it had a termination point that was just glowing, and inside of it, there were translucent colors, like a rainbow. There was one color, and then inside of that I could see another color, and inside of that, another color. And there was a presence there, and it was speaking to me, but not with words. And at that point, I was so excited that I was drawing myself closer and closer to it, like, go to the light. <laughs> and I was just so in love with this. And I knew that it was a, an entity. It was a powerful thing. And I knew that it was the Creator, too. But I did not know his name because I had not yet opened the book that Phyllis had put in my path. So at that point, I willed myself closer and closer, and I could not get any closer than so far. And then I woke up, and I was so excited that I was sweating and breathing hard, and I said, I'm, I was filled with joy. You know, I, all I knew was that everything was going to be all right, but I had not really, I had apparently taken in a lot of information, but it was not, you know, the kind of communication that we had. It was another kind. It was actually, this. it was an infilling. It was an enabling. Something that was enabling me to go to the next level. And I knew that there was something important that happened there. And I don't want to say this was a Joseph Smith experience, you know, but there weren't any funny little plates or anything like that. Nothing like that. This was reality, but it was spiritual. And then after that, came the, the next levels and the next steps. Phyllis was praying for me. Probably that's why this happened. Because she sent him to me. And I pray for him to go to others too. In their dreams. You know. How did that lead to fossilized customs? Well, it led to fossilized customs 
by means of me studying and me studying and taking notes and I had assembled pictures that I had drawn uh, to illustrate the texts and the scriptures and I was using scripture as the basis and I always quote scripture and then I used more scripture than, 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 than my own words and I, I came out with a little pamphlet called Bold Mud. Well Bold Mud was a me thinking of myself as just being dust and uh, we're all that way and we're bold because we have something in us that's valuable. We're vessels so we can be bold as lions even though we're just dust. So this little thing developed into Fascicle 1 of Fossilized Customs because I, it, I had to keep getting more information and more information. So I came out with various editions of Bold Mud. And then I came out with the first fascicle of Fossilized Customs. And that led to four fascicles total. And then I put the four fascicles together and it became the first edition of Fossilized Customs. And I did write Fossilized Customs. There wasn't, I didn't get it from the internet. The well, internet didn't really exist. What, what, year, what year was that, honey? Well, it must have been something like 1986 that I started the research, or 87. You spent years in It was the years. I had, up, between 1986 and 1997, I had all done all these things I was talking about. And then there was many, over a decade of research there. You know, just going to buy, I was buying encyclopedias, sets of encyclopedias to get net knowledge, to get, um, to track this stuff, and to, uh, and scriptures, different translations. I, I bought my first concordance. It was a, you know, it had the Strong's numbers, but it wasn't Strong's. It was the NASB, which some people say is evil. There are a couple of sentences in there that have bad translations, but anyway, it had the, the name Yahweh in it, and I was thinking, that's great, you know, and you know at that time I I thought that there was a W in that in the Hebrew. Well, I've learned that that's actually a 13th century appearance. It's a W, you know, but it's really a one U, really. So anyway, the that's the way the fossilized customs developed. And then as I'd acquire more, I, I, the fossilized customs kept getting a little bigger and a little bigger. And I think it's going to have 244 pages in the 10th edition. I'm not sure about that. But, you know. Yeah, he's working on that right now. I'm but, working on it. But not only did he buy encyclopedias, but he spent hours in the library researching the oldest encyclopedias and dictionaries that they had. He would actually go to the archives and they would pull out these volumes for him to study from. And you can't even find those anymore. Because this research that he did is just... Un, it's unreproducible right now. Is that the right yeah. word? Un, you cannot re reproduce it. The, what the study that he did. Well, there was a lot of research in there, and I was uh, basically though everything was being brought to me. I, I was seeing things pop up. I would I look for things sometimes where I'm tr trying to study something, and Yahusha actually brings it to me by whatever means. You know, it, it doesn't float through the air, but it may as well be doing that because the information just finds its way there and it plugs in. Like Danny you know? McCombs? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bless his heart. Well, Danny McCombs, yeah. Yes. So just so there's not a massive influx of emails, you're not stating that you had a Joseph Smith experience. You, you're stating that Yahusha can come to you in whatever state you might have been in. Oh, yeah. And reach you. Yeah, yeah. He can speak through a donkey if he needs to, even to an unbeliever. And through an unbeliever. I mean, even Pharaoh was used, you know. But uh, the thing of it is, though, the, the simplicity of the truth is what people don't really realize. But they're so caught up in so many strongholds that they are incapable of comprehending the simplicity, you know. Sister, how did you feel as a Christian woman that your husband's on the bed having trances? Oh, well, you know what? He didn't tell me about it right away, but um, later he told me after he had... Wasn't it after you'd been immersed that you told me about? Yeah. He, he told me about that later, but you know what? At that time, 
I was having visions from you um, he, because you know you have to remember at that as far as I know he was still a science person not Christian not reading the scriptures and I had a, a vision given to me of us walking hand in hand in ministry uh, I, it, I, I, I just remembered so distinctly that we were just he, we were just leading thousands of people and we were working on it together of course my only concept at that time was from a Christian mindset you know I, I didn't know that we were going to learn, learn new truths but I was just I woke up and it was almost like Sarah laughing about getting pregnant in her old age I woke up and I laughed and I said yeah like that's going to happen you know because Liz was as far away from being a Christian minister as you could get and he still is but it was so funny because that was a vision Yehuda told me that we were going to be walking hand in hand in a ministry and I just buried it into my heart and never thought about it again until things started you know coming together like they have been well now we aren't the type of people though that feel like we're in charge of anything oh, don't no. misunderstand no I didn't mean that we're just as like we're we put ourselves on any the lower level well, as we can you know because the people need to know that this truth is so simple that you don't have to have some high education well when I use the word ministry I yeah. use it in its true Serving. word tell them what ministry means well ministry means a work like yes. the in in Great Britain they call things the ministry of uh, this and the ministry of that it's a department you know it's the, you know the right. it's like the levels of government that do service their service you know so we're servants that's what we really are slaves right yeah we feel it too. yeah we really are. we love it though because we know you know Yahusha is uh, we're not doing it to earn anything. It's just that as long as we have breath in us, this is a temporary life. It's just a fleeting thing. And uh, it goes by like that. I mean, it's uh, it's over. But as, as long as we have breath in us, we're going to try to help as many people as we can to learn how to love one another. Because, you know, it's love is the destination. And Yahusha is the way that we walk there, you know with his spirit we can arrive there it's simple we, but we make it complicated the redemption of Israel is his mission you know that's what and he does it through his body and we're just two people you know in, in his body and you're another one and you and Amy and many others around the world you know that uh, we need to get more unity and and love among those those various fragmented groups how did the um the, the islands come about was that uh was that when you're still kind of coming out of christianity and you thought you wanted to have a build an assembly like a building of some sort or no it had nothing it to do was with me that. mainly trying to get away from that store uh, i was when i woke up to the truth in around 1985 i was just traumatized by the work the, the job that I had and I was thinking I've got to get away from that and uh, very quickly from studying scripture I found out that I was unequally yoked with an unbeliever and of course Bob was my lifelong friend he was my childhood friend and I wasn't feeling like I mean I love Bob and Bob loves me but the thing of it is Bob at that point and as far as this point he's still you know outside the, the faith as far as I know but here's the thing. I wanted to get away, but at the same time, I was tied financially to him, but also because I loved him. And we're here to bring the lost. So I'm thinking, I've got to stay there, and that's what you do with a marriage. If you mm -hmm. find one person that comes into the truth, they're to remain with their spouse. And in a contract, that's what mm -hmm. we have to do. So I hung around there, and I said, well, wait a minute. This is exactly what Yahushua would be doing. He wouldn't run away from the people who needed him the most. So, and I saw the customers and I said, wow, I've got, the, I've got a huge field where I can plant. It's perfect. 
So uh, I continued to remain there, but even so, even so, I was looking for an exit door. Mm -hmm. So around uh, 2000, year 2000, mm -hmm. I had decided that I'd try to build another business so that I could get my hand on another branch so that I could eventually get out of that. And we bought a little piece of property where we have the building now, and we began to you know, make, make plans on how to build a facility there. And slowly, over about two years, I guess it was, they, the building finally got up. And it, it, the, the guy said it was gonna take four months to build it, but it took, <laughs> it took about two years. And uh, anyway, we eventually moved in there on the upper level, but we had the lower level to operate as a restaurant, you know, and the basement was kind of unoccupied at that time. And then over the years, we found out that the restaurant wasn't working. Even with just one or two employees, it was just un impossible to get enough business. So what we did was we leased it out and we continued to live upstairs. I guess this was in the like 2004, 2005. Yeah. And then we stayed up there uh, for a while, and, and then we rented out the bottom, and then along comes someone else that says we'd like to rent the basement. So we rented out the basement, too. And we didn't want them to open on the Sabbath, but we had leased the, the space to them, and then we found out that they were operating on the Sabbath, and that was breaking our hearts because we were upstairs on the Sabbath every, every week and going, man... Uh, eventually, we, uh, you know, had to, there was conflict between the two operators, uh, the first floor renter and the basement renter. The the Louisville School of Music, was it? Yeah. Had a little uh, yeah. school of rock. Yeah, the school of rock. They and were making a lot of noise They, they were a Christian, uh, they're a Christ, kind of a, kind of a Christian organization, but mm -hmm. they, they, they metamorphed too. Yeah. So anyway, that's uh, the, the way the building was built, you know. And then we took over the building completely with, well, not the basement, because the yeah. Louisville School of Rock is still there. But we've got the rest of the building for our uh, Torah Institute now, the whole building. Well, you know, well, the, the renters on the first floor started doing things that we did, really didn't approve yeah. of, and yeah. we, we asked them to leave. Well, they we started just didn't serving their... alcohol yeah. and... Uh, not that alcohol is evil, but it's just that we, we didn't want a bar there. No, you know? and we told them. We told them we don't want a bar on our property, you know. And then it was it, it was morphing into a bar. And yeah. uh, it, it was more of a bar after a couple of years than it was anything else. It was supposed to be a computer game place, you know. At that time, an internet cafe kind of computer thing. And uh, it, it was changing. So... So that that's the story of the islands. Yeah. What did you uh, know about uh, running a restaurant? Did you have interest in food back then or running a restaurant? Or? Yes, when I was in the Air Force, I was taking courses in restaurant management, and I graduated from a correspondence course. It was based in Chicago, Illinois. And while I was in o o Okinawa, I was studying restaurant management, even while I was working on airplanes, you know fighting a war in Vietnam. Uh, anyway, because my mind was not on war, you know. My mind was on, like, what am I going to be doing, you know. I was 21, 20, 20, 21, 22 years old. And, you know, I got out of the Air Force when I was 22, and that's when I hooked up with Phyllis, and we got married. But, uh, yeah, we're going back and forth Yeah, now. Leo. But, uh, yeah, the islands, the Strawberry Islands was a restaurant, you know. We wanted it to be a, a vegetarian restaurant because at that point we were thinking that uh, that you had, if you ate meat, if you ate meat at all, it had to be kosher. That That's where we were at. And, um, of course, mm -hmm. we knew you couldn't, it had to be kosher meat. And um, so we wanted to have a vegetarian restaurant because kosher, to, to have that kosher label on it was too expensive. And we thought, well, what if we had a vegetarian restaurant and people could just feel, anybody could walk in and, and not worry about eating un, anything unclean or, you know, but it was the wrong place and the wrong time. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it if just, we were in some other places, that might work, but not where we were. Those people are thinking about where's the meat, you know, where's the... Yeah, yeah. They, they wanted their meat. Yeah. This was pre, pre-9-11, pre wasn't it? Well, it really was. Actually, Actually no. It, no, it wasn't. Because that's 9/11, what happened to us. That's really what happened to us was 9-11. Because the economy just was hit hard, and it just kept going down, and it's 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 still kind of sliding. You know, you know the, the building was being built. Yeah. I was be, trying to be a, a realtor because I was trying to make you know some some kind of money. Yeah. But at, that's how we found the the land was because I had a realtor license. But that was the same year I quit being a realtor. She was a realtor for about one year. Yeah, one year, and then um, nine eleven hit. Then the building was finished the following year. Mm-hmm. And we started the restaurant in 2002, October 2002, and it just never, never it, it, really the economy there. just w- yeah. was in the, yeah. the dumps. But here's the thing, Phyllis was a, a very introverted person before she became a realtor. She was so, oh, I don't know if I can talk to anybody, anybody, <laughs> even answering the phone. You know, but look at her now. Being a realtor was part of Yahusha's training. Mm-hmm. You know, it really opened this woman up. She was uh, very timid and uh, almost anything she was afraid of, you know. <laughs> it's amazing. It's funny how you, you she will use a career or a trade to, to teach you about yourself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She's fearless. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I, t- I have to answer the phone and take, get a lot of attacks. Yeah. And I get a lot of love, so it balances out, you know. So you've... Uh, so you found yourself in a building. Uh, what made you build it? Were well, you obviously building it for a restaurant? That's why it looks a bit like a fort and a, like a, a facility. Well, you call it a facility, don't you? The, the tin sides. Yeah, we designed uh, various styles. And one of the more uh, interesting ones were the, this tin-sided building. You know, and so I drew up the plans for it because there's Ten Commandments. And uh, we would even put a copy of one of the editions of Fossilized Customs down into the one of the uh, foundations of uh, the building. So at some point, you know, if it survives, uh, you know, enough time, it'll still be there. And uh, you know, I think it. I, I think it was the one with, where I had page numbers, which is good. Oh yeah, the first edition. The first edition, there were no page numbers. <laughs> he, he he was so new at this, he didn't know to put. He thought oh, the funny. publisher would put the page numbers on there. Yeah. But, but they didn't. No, you have to put everything. You had to put it yeah. on yourself. So, people from Australia were calling us and saying, hey, uh, I think I've got a defective copy. My, my copy doesn't have any page numbers. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I, I was That's amazed funny. that they were even there. What were they doing in Australia? <laughs> he was. We we were mailing those fossils, those first two, two or three editions out by hand, yeah. all over the world, mm. and we didn't even have it on the, the the internet didn't even exist. Not in the form it does now. It was, it not not yeah. It, there there was you could get on yeah. bulletin boards, but you didn't have the internet as it is today. Oh, no. The bulletin boards. That was all you saw. Really. Yeah. yeah. Do you have? Uh, a copy of, uh, what was it, Mud, what was it called? Bold Mud. Bold Mud. You know what, David uh, was just telling me the other day that he still has a copy of Bold Mud, and he he oh, he was thinking that Lou needs to reissue it. See, Bold Mud and all those fossicles that he did first, he wrote those by hand. He didn't even have a... Um, Word processor. A word processor. He, for, he wrote them by hand. Yeah, they wrote. Everything was drawn. The pictures were drawn. All the word. It was printed, picture perfect. Then, then he got. Then he bought a word processor, and that's when he did Fossil's Custom, wasn't it? Yes, or one of the, the fascicles, maybe. One of the fascicles, yeah, the fascicles was the fascicles. on the what, word, word processor. Word processor. Yeah. Okay, then he got a word processor. Yeah. But yeah, the very first one, and, and David has a copy of that. He thinks you should copy yeah. it. As it is? Make, make souvenir copies wow. or something. I don't know what he wants yeah. to do. How many years has it been? We could have a, what is it, a 25-year edition or something like that. 
commemorative version. Yeah. What, what year was it, honey? Can you remember? Because no, I don't remember. I can't. But it was probably 1987 or so. Or maybe a little bit maybe later, later then, because it that. seems like both both boys had been born. Yeah. Adam was born in 87. It seems well, like it was after that a little bit. It might have been. It might have been a couple of years after that. But uh, we'll have to look in the edition, see if I wrote the date in there, you know. But, uh, well, you didn't put the date in the first edition of Fossil's yeah. Customs. And now you've showed me the fascicles. You showed me the fascicles on the Tor Talk show. That well, they were if we have the copy of the Bold Mud, we'll have to put that up on one if we can find one. You know. I'll ask David to bring, yeah. give, you, give, it, yeah. give us his copy if he'll let go of it. Yeah. <laughs> I love that title, Bold Mud. That's really coming from a a scientist's point of view. Isn't it? Yeah. You yeah, know, it one thing he didn't mention when he was talking about the, the title you he also was talking about how funny it was that people would get angry about anything because we're just mud and how bold is that for yeah. mud to get mad or angry about yeah. something you when you when you looks at us and he sees us really enraged about something he's looking at him and going he whoa look at that mud it's really angry <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's so embarrassing when you realize oh i'm sorry I'm, I'm only mud. Yeah. You know, why would I get mad? It's mad mud, you know. Yeah. That's nuts. It's nuts. How did you first hear about uh, Chris Costa or any kind of uh, scripture translation that might have been not NIV or not yeah. Christian or King James? Or well, that's a good question. Where did, you, where did you first come across some kind of real scripture translation? Well, when I was doing my research at U of L, and so forth, some years into that, I was encountering some of the other people that I was fellowshipping with, just on one-on-one -on -one basis, you know. And we were like I remember uh, Michael Caudell, who was a young young man at that time, just a little younger than I was, really, and he. Uh, was coming along with some of the studies that I was showing him and, and then he showed me things and we, we did a little of this and that and there were several other friends that we had made that were sort of in a little circle of a, a fellowship uh, of, of people that were studying scripture and out of one of them it seems like I don't know if it was one of them or somehow I got a hold of a copy of a hard little hardcover book called Final Reformation Oh yeah. and that Final Reformation was uh, amazing because it was the same thread that we were following of truth and Chris Coster was in South Africa so I, I wrote to him and we corresponded by mostly male you know and back and forth and I was amazed that he would even write to me because you know I understood that this man had been doing this at the same time that I was doing mine and I didn't think that he I mean, there was no competition between us we were both excited to discover there was someone else on another part of the planet doing the same thing at the same time discovering the same things about what was wrong Chris Costa wrote the final Reformation, did he? Yes, he did. That was what became "Come Out of Her, My People," but that was after his death. You know. Oh, and they changed the name. After they changed death? the name of it after his death. Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. But uh, it was the final Reformation, and it was a wonderful research tool that he had done, and it was just basically confirming everything that I had discovered, and I and it made me feel secure because I thought, well, maybe I'm not crazy. You know, there's somebody else. And that really gave me a lot of encouragement. And so, uh, and he was so kind, you know, his, and, but you know, he, he was, I could get the tone in his letters that he wasn't going to take any kind of false teachings. The scriptures is the basis of everything. And, but yet he was very kind. Well, how did, how did that lead to the scriptures? Or was he well, doing the, the scriptures, scriptures was something that, I, I don't know what the first edition was. Was it, was it 1993? 
I don't I don't know. I no, can't I think I think it was 1997 because 1998 they came out with the second edition that had made all the corrections. But I remember a copy that seemed to have a copyright in it, 1993. Maybe. But that was I think the year he died, 1993 or 1994. But I remember vaguely that it was either 1993 or 1994 that Chris died, and it was traumatic for me. I couldn't believe it because I felt such a camaraderie. I felt like I was, uh, I, you know, I, I could just feel the, the, the loss, you know, because he was so important to me. And, uh, of course, Yahushua is most important, but I, the, the, the Yahushua was in him, and it, and it led him to do the translation and the uh, writing of those truths in the book Final Reformation. And then subsequently after that, Wilhelm Wolfhart contacted me after his death and asked me if I would be willing to take up some of the tasks for ISR, Institute for Scripture Research, for the United States to be a director of things here. And we instituted the, uh, the corporation, so we came into existence. So Institute for Scripture Research became a, an entity here in the United States. And, uh, but that was much later. Yeah, it was. It was a few years later. Yeah. Did you help uh, Chris Costa at all in any of his translation work, or while he was translating the scriptures, or had he had he already finished when you came along? Yeah, he'd already finished all that, uh -huh. and I was working with the um, just uh, you know because Wilhelm and the other directors were trying to work out the next printing, and they wanted to get some of the typos corrected and try, try to find out where the problems might be and so the next edition would be better and of course we were emailing the information to one another by that time pretty regularly that would make the next one improved so they were always interested in improvements and I was making recommendations to change the font to the original script and I kept excitedly explaining to them that no one has ever done this since the Septuagint because the original Septuagint that was translated in the second century BC was, or BCE, was uh, retaining the script of the Paleo Hebrew in its original form. And, you know, you can see that on the great Yeshiyahu scroll, you know, the, the scroll of the book, the Hekel Sefer in Jerusalem. Yeah. But. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So they've sort of changed it all now, have they? Do you, um, the way are they still running it? Sort of how Chris ran it. In a general way, yeah, yeah. And uh, now, subsequently, though, uh, Johan and his wife Marie are running things over in South Africa, and Wilhelm has moved to New Zealand now. So, but uh, you know, I'm uh, basically going to be you know, uh, stepping down very shortly as my last act of ISR, the corporation here. We're going to dissolve the corporation here in the United States, which is sad, you know. You know, we, we wanted to see everything go uh, well with that, and, you know, but uh, we're still going to be, you know, close to Wilhelm and, and the others, you know, you know, just as much as ever, maybe more so. And... Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. Chris has been, uh, I, I was corresponding with Chris for years, and uh, his uh, insights, I would ask him for insights because I didn't, I didn't know how old he was. Uh, I just detected that he was older in the faith than I was. And I remember excitedly writing to him to explain what the festivals meant because I, I detected that there was something that they they were pointing at that was not the literal things because the festivals of of Israel that were that are given in Deuteronomy 16 and Leviticus 23 are about redemption and I was wondering if he could give me all of the insight that he could on those issues and he gave me uh, something that I published in the fossilized customs in fact I quoted Chris's own letter and Subsequently, as the years passed, I noticed that he never mentioned what first fruits meant. 
And first fruits, of course, is the resurrection and what that means. And apparently Chris did never know what that meant. You know, that first fruits was in the midst of the Feast of Matzah. And, you know, that it, later it was revealed by, by Yahushua what it meant. But um, I wish Chris could have known. You know, that is so exciting. Ever since you knew Chris, did they have, uh, was there anybody trying to, um, you know, come at him and say, you're nuts, this is, this version is not correct, it shouldn't be oh. done like this? Did he copyright or anything like that? What was the go back then? Well, I don't believe Chris intended to copyright the, the book, that he, the scriptures. I don't know that, though, because he never discussed that. But... Um, I understand that around 1993 there was a copyright taken out and I don't know if he did it or if the board of directors did it so the translation would be protected you know of course if they alter it they holding the copyright they can do that you know mm -hmm. which they have done you know they mm -hmm. they translated uh, things a little differently some people are not happy with what the changes are so you should be able to do that then, because even though it's Yahuwah's word, I mean, if nobody's discovered what it says or translated it that way, that would make it an original text, wouldn't it? Well, I guess in one frame of reference it would, but I'm uh, not thinking that we need to trans uh, to copyright. I wouldn't. I don't like copywriting Yahuwah's word, but, no. you know, in fact, I'm in the process now of thinking about getting a copyright for Fossilized Customs. Understandably. I don't know. I'm not going to sue anybody if they, you know, steal it. So what's the point, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go, yippee, you know, you're, you're paying for the printing now, now and, uh, you know, and the shipping. And, but the word's getting out there because it's not about profit. It isn't about that. It's about getting the truth into as many people as you can. How do you guys feel that thousands and thousands of people have been affected by what you guys have put together? And we know it's Yahushua, but what, just from those very seed thoughts 30 odd years ago, and now it's, it's, it's gone worldwide. It's humbling. Yeah, it's not us, it's all Yahushua, but at the same time, I'm concerned about those that might have been injured by the truth, because see, the truth can divide families. And I've heard of people who, you, you know, when you get a little bit of knowledge and you use it as a weapon, it can be very destructive. But you need to understand that when you understand something better than someone else, doesn't empower you above them it actually makes you more of a responsible person to make sure that the people are not injured by it if you're sharing it with them and to be patient you know because you have to be patient with other people and not to husbands and wives get divided over it you know when we first <clears throat> came into various things in the scriptures that I, I would study something and I'd say well Phyllis we're not supposed to be traveling on the Sabbath or we're not supposed to eat that blood. We're not supposed to do this and that. I'd show her and she, she would get really excited and say, what? But then I'd show her and she'd say, well, that's what it says. Yeah. We're going to have to change. So you see, repentance is ongoing. It's something you can you never stop doing. And so your heart is always f bent towards repentance. It's what you want, you know. You want to be wrong and let Yahuwah be right. And that's all, all you really have to do. And, you know, put the other person above yourself, you know, that you're trying to help coach, you know. And I was feeling some heat there, you know, when I'd share things. But when I saw it, I'd said, well, let's just calm down. Let's just not get excited. Let's be calm. And I was going to be patient, you know, because Yahushua was leading me that way, you know. But some people would say, no, I'm the man. I'm the husband. You must obey me. Uh, you have to be gentle when you have things that you want to impose on other people. You don't want to really impose them. You want them to. You want it to well up from within them, and that's what she was doing. When the truth comes in, 
then you're controlled from the truth. The truth controls you. Re remember that day when you discovered you we weren't supposed to work on Sabbath? You were supposed to go into work that day? Yeah. And you just said, I'm not going. I'm not going to go. You know, there was, a, there was a time when, uh, well, it, with that store that I work at, I was the vice president, Bob was the president, and we were the only ones involved. Phyllis, I think, was a vice president too, just for the books, you know, because they require three. That, but oh. what happened was Bob decided that he wanted to get off and go and start another business much like I did, but only we had a contractual agreement where he maintained stock ownership, but I took over full control. But it was only for a few months. And I, what I did was we reorganized re the, the ownership. So I was president, she was vice president, and she was secretary and treasurer. <laughs> so that on the books, it looked like we were the only owners. And I closed the, the store on the Sabbath. And I was in process of changing some things inside. And because the, the store sales went down and I was tied to Bob uh, to pay a percentage, he saw the dropping in sales and I was didn't care because I, 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 I have to trust in Yahuwah. So he said, well, let's, this isn't working after several months. He said, Let, let's go back to the way we were doing things before and I'll open the store on the Sabbath. And I wasn't happy about that idea, but Bob was languishing and he was hurting financially. So I said, well, you own the stock so we can reorganize it back to the way it was. And that's what we did. And now, you know, it, uh, you know, you can find out that we're just half, you know, vice president. I'm vice president now, as it was before. So uh, that was... Uh, an interesting thing. But then uh, that was after we started to get away, too. Because, see, I tried to get away by starting Strawberry Islands. Yeah. I thought if we could just get away and get something else going, then we could just forget that, you know, pay that off if we could and get things going. But the economy just went, just started flatlining, you know. And it was impossible to really get anything done. But what Yahusha did was... He's given us a facility to run this thing from. And, you know, we're $450,000 in debt now on that, which is sounds like a lot, but it's only a third of what we, what we started out with. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're really making progress. And so mm -hmm. uh, that was, of course, what was that? Uh, 12 years work, you know, to yeah. try to get it down to that point, you know. So... My prayer is to get that debt paid off, you know. So if, if you if you who should can use you anywhere, would you say that the thing that is tying you to the shop is mainly a financial thing? You don't really want to just, as people have said, oh, just go bankrupt, who cares? So you don't want to do that if you don't have to, do you? No, nobody wants to go bankrupt. I have no ties to anything of, in, the, in the world materially. I mean, it, it just that what I'd like to do is do things properly, but if uh, Yahuwah supernaturally paid that loan off and enabled us to pay off the other debts that are p being paid for by that income, has to do both, then, yeah, <laughs> you know, I pray every day that I be released from that place. But there's good being done because there's people that are picking it up. But he's shown me a new way. If that ever gets paid off, because, see, if you, if you restructure, if I just walked away, then the bank would call the loan. And then the place would be for sale. Bob would be out at work, and that's another family. And I would have no income to support Tor Institute, so that would be a bad decision to make. So if you restructure your internal organization, the, the, the bank con controls you personally too, because I have a personal signature on that. So even if I ran away, I'm still owing the money. You know, it doesn't change anything. If I went personally bankrupt, sure, but. You know, what? why do that when, you know, you can, you know, we'd be living on the street, you know. But yeah. I mean, I'm reaching people, but he did show me a way to get rid of it. If, I, if, if ever something supernatural happened and the loans were all paid off, then I can leave and I can put a kiosk inside that store and let Bob run the store. But there'll be a kiosk with a video screen and a, I imagine a, a 
a, an internet line going into the store and there'll be YouTube videos running perpetually on this screen and books all along the kiosk to See, buy. You, have, you haven't mentioned, there's, there's two things keeping him to the store. One is the financial situation, but the other is the job that he is doing in that store, and that's why he's talking about it. He didn't mention the job yet. That's why he has to have the kiosk, is because he's doing a job in the mission field, a job that nobody else wants to do. I mean, I haven't seen anybody say, Brother Lou, I'll come and witness to these people every day for you, so you don't have to, but nobody stepped up to want to do that. Yeah. So you see, it's it's two things, not only the financial situation, but the fact that Yehuda's using him there in the store. But if he can set up this kiosk, then that his work would be continuing yeah, yeah. in his absence. Even if I'm not there. And it would probably be doing a better job because, <laughs> no. you know, well, yeah, a real person's always better. But uh, because somebody that's spirit-filled that's talking to an unbeliever, that can jump on them, you know. And Yahushua can work through that person directly. But... Uh, he can also work through the kiosk. Now the kiosk is interesting because see, there's a video store that's just gone out of business here in our community, and and I've purchased this kiosk, which is a uh, this large object that's several feet wide, square, and about eight feet high, or seven and a half feet high, and it's beautiful, and it can hold books, and it can hold a, a TV, you know, a, a flat screen, and it could be connected to the internet and it would just be something somebody could walk up to. It would only take up a, a very small amount of square foot and a person that's drawn to it will just walk up and go, what? And then let me just take this pamphlet with me. We'll have free materials there, you know, but I don't have to be there. See, that would be something I'd put in writing and this thing has to be connected to the internet. It has to be on, it has to be running and it has to be well stocked. And I'd check on it, too. Well, you know. the reason this is exciting is the very fact that this is, is being put in place could mean Yehuda's about to move. Yeah. You know? I mean, we, we, we didn't know who would carry on and lose work mm -hmm. there if he wasn't there anymore. And now that, you know, problem's already been solved. So we're thinking something supernatural could be about to happen. Yeah. I'm always waiting for Don't, that. Yeah, I mean, it could be years down the line, yeah. you know. Well, even if I'm dead, this thing would still be working and talking. Yeah. And that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, we'll make sure of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and maybe we can replicate yeah, that in your in your shop. Yeah. <laughs> even when you don't have time to talk to people, this thing will talk to them. And it'll give them brochures, and, and, it, and it'll it, they can buy a book or a video, you know. Pick up a video, a DVD. Do you guys get around to every person in your seminar and find out where they've come from? Well, they, uh, some of them come up to us and they tell, tell us who they are, where they're from. Uh, and there's a lot of people that come again and again and again. And some that don't show up and then they pop up. There's people that, you know, skip over a, a month or two and then they come. You know, there's a lot of that, you know. We know them, you know. You know, but, by name. but there's more people come from out of yeah. state than than right within, well, I mean, out of the city limits than than right. They drive great distances. Yeah, they mm -hmm. there there are people like, like there's a gentleman that drives three hours to get to the seminar, and he's so excited about it that he he gives me money so that to make sure that I bring enough food to feed everybody because he wants to hang out and socialize with people once he gets there because it's not, you know, it's such a long drive. He wants to eat and socialize and so he c covers the expense of the of the food that we that we, you know. Well, and a lot of people are coming from places that are well, there's no other people that believe anything yeah. like what they believe. Their families don't understand and they're Friends don't get it, you know, because they're, you know, cookie cutter Christianity, you know, from where the, most of these people are. You know? you know, it reminds me, there was a couple, uh, a gentleman that came into to the store that came into the islands 
you know, to and and yeah. David was there to talk to him. And would they they came it in was two. Yeah. the two men? I yeah. forgot their names, but they probably wouldn't want their names mentioned. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they they came uh, met Lou at the store, bought a book, Fossilized Customs, and then came directly over to Torah Institute, and was talking to David for about forty five minutes, but. He, he, they were supposed to be at the meeting. I didn't see them at the mm. meeting. Now that you mentioned, I was like, "Where were they? They weren't at the meeting." But well, I guess they, it was too quick for them to make plans to come. But they, you know, they're really excited now. They know the yeah. truth. They didn't know the truth before. Yeah, in my store where I work with Bob, the, a lot of materials are there. I don't have everything there, like, uh, but uh, a lot of people come there from out of state. Out of, a long distance, some place, sometimes from California or, or New York or Florida. A lot of Floridians are always finding their way in there. And they tell us, they go, wow, I, I heard about this place. And then they come in and then suddenly they're walking back there and they're picking up something and they're going, I've got to get this. And I'm pretty surprised to see a, a video and a book in somebody's hand. And it just makes my heart leap with joy because they, they picked it up on their own, you know. But a lot of times, somebody will walk up and they'll just start chatting about something uh, that maybe they're somewhere along the way and they're trying to get more. And they'll ask me a couple of questions and we'll chat for maybe 15 or 20 minutes and we can help them out with uh, maybe a video or something that's on that topic, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really, uh, you know, I think why I'm there, you know. But that kiosk is possibly going to be the answer for me, uh, yeah. you know, yeah, later. Nice. Yeah. Do you find that the average person, uh, like even Natsarim, really couldn't care less about uh, the idols? Because, I mean, I watched it and thought it was hilarious. You know, I thought, this is, this is what a fantastic spot to work. Well, you know, little fun little trinkets in there. Well, like Paul and, said, uh, uh, most people don't know, have the knowledge that idols are nothing, you know. Mm. So you find that if somebody has a big problem with the idols, it's generally because of an ulterior motive. Yeah. Well, you know, the weak brother and sister, yeah. weak meaning untrained and unknown, they don't know enough, the, those are the weak ones. Now, it isn't that they, their faith isn't great, it's just that they don't have enough knowledge, and they're, as they learn, they realize things. But when they're really young and, and weak in the faith, weak in the training, they can be affected by certain things that they see in the world because they're still in training and uh, those that are further along can use those things to say well you know this is nothing at all and this is one of the problems but the things that are in the store uh, were actually put there you know by and large by Bob who likes the, the style it's a style thing with him. He likes it because it's archaic looking and, and mysterious. And uh, Egypt was something very uh, mysterious to, well, every, uh, everybody, you know, because there were tombs and strange beliefs, you know. And uh, Egyptology was something that he's been really interested in. In fact, our first store together was called Pyramid Records. Pyramid records, and we had a, a big pyramid-style motif. And of course, some some people might think that that's a pagan item. It is on the top of an obelisk. You know, you see a pyramid at the top. But uh, who knows? The first obelisk may have not have had that shape on it. It might have just been a, you know, because it didn't mention that in the book of Daniel. The object that's mentioned in Daniel is so many feet wide. You know, and so so many feet tall, and it has the dimensions of an obelisk. It doesn't say it had a pyramid on top, though. But the pyramids, the original pyramids, may have been pre-flood, the original ones, the really big ones that are in there. But uh, and they may or may not have had anything to do with idolatry. You know, but uh, mm. you know, there, there's people that say that there there is a problem. But anyway, the other items, though, they're, they are definitely reflecting the identities of Egyptian deities. You know, it's not a good idea to have those things around, but they're there. And I call the little case they're in Spook Central. Bob knows what I'm talking about. Spook Central. 
Yeah. 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 You know. Do you guys have any believers around you, or do you find that they, they people hear the word and they they spread out back where they came from? Do you have any people sort of in Louisville or our family? You, you know, yeah, our they're... our children. Oh. Uh, Michael, his children. Um, there's uh, David, Janet, David, David and Shelby, David and Shelby, and those are people who were in Christianity or nothing that came in and then there was there's travelers that that we know that you know we don't want to mention all their names but uh, that have come into the true faith as a result of uh, coming into that shop you know that, that music store so mostly you who are scattering us yeah. far and wide we're salt it's spread thin mm. we give flavor to the culture you know how how have you felt uh, over the last thirty years about the uh, separation process? How Yahuwah separates us unto Himself from everything. Well, you know, He said that He would be, He came to divide a mother and you know from her children and a father and so forth, a brother against brother and so forth and. He, came, he described it as a sword, you know, a divisive thing that we'd be pitted against one another and even to the point where parents would put their children to death and vice versa over, you know, the religiosity. You know, the religiosity is a, is a piousness that, it's a false piety is what it is, but, you know, what do you think about it? I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the question, really. Whenever things go down in our life and uh, we feel separated from people, right? we realize that um, Yahuwah, Yahushua has done that because he's so jealous and wants us our attention so much that he separated us from that thing that wasn't healthy and separated us from that person, separated us from that person. And it seems like a negative thing at the time, but we realize he's drawn us closer to him for his purpose. That's what I mean by the separation process. To be set apart. How do you feel about being set apart? I feel isolated. Well, I, yeah, I, because I we don't love the same things that they love. Yeah. But we're not so much separated from the people, but we're separated from the activities. That, and that, that's the that's, thing. That's, that's what, what I, that, that's why I didn't understand the question, because you're, it's the activities, like when his family has their Christmas gathering. Valentine's and, and, or and, Halloween. You or, know, when, the, yeah. you know, they would have all these, that was the only time they got together were, were on some, when, a pagan day, mm -hmm. and we just wouldn't be there, and, and they, they would mock us and make yeah. fun. At first we'd try to be there just to, you know, to explain to them why we shouldn't be doing this, but then they'd mock and make fun of us to our face, so we just decided to quit going so that it would be, you know, we wouldn't be made fun of, you know, and of course... We show love to them, but it's hard to to keep getting jabbed at with, uh, yeah. you know, these uh, criticisms and things, you know. We don't try to criticize. That's where a lot of Nazarene not get off on the wrong path, by getting critical and judgmental of one another instead of uh, encouraging because we're uh, we're supposed to encourage Romans 12 is something that shows us that we're to not be like that but we're to encourage one another and lift each other up put the other person higher and put in more importance you know and always be uh, deferent and, and 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 help them instead of tearing them down all the time you know how do your uh, children feel as uh, young men uh, seeing the way you guys would operate in certain situations? Do, you, do they sort of follow along with you or do you have to sort of give them a bit of an understanding on how to how we should be doing this? You know, do they sort of want to go gung-ho and start? <laughs> well, now our two children, uh, Adam is 24 and Michael's 30, they're fine now. They know the truth, and they have to nav navigate the, the storms and weirdness as we do. But the children, the young ones, uh, Elijah, Elena, and Ethan, they're 
have, we still guide them and point to it and say, now that's a pagan thing. You know, that's something we don't have anything to do with. Uh, whether it, it be, uh, you know, Satan's Sabbath or Satan's birthday or, uh, you know, the wrong name, you know. We see them being torn because they're, 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 in, going, a Christian they're school. in a Christian school, which is much better than being in a public school, you know, because of the what we see going on in the public schools. So they're they're kind of that's why they need constant guidance is because they're young and they're yeah. being influenced by these Christianized pagan activities. Well, the light doesn't have to run away from the darkness. It's the uh, darkness that has to be dispelled by the light. And if you're the the light then you might stun the deer. The deer sees the light, and the deer goes, what? But we're not the deer. We don't have to be afraid. It's just that we're, we shine the light. And, you know, one of, an example of that would be Elijah, the oldest one. He's about 11. We picked him up a couple of nights ago, or a couple of afternoons ago. Wasn't it yesterday? Okay. Yeah, it was yesterday. We picked him up from school, the three of them, and Elijah was wearing this shirt. And it, on the shirt, it said... Yehuda in Hebrew letters, and the Daleth had a doorway on it, and it talked, to, and it was quoting Yehusha's words, "I am the doorway for the sheep," and uh, Yahuwah was was right there in front of their eyes, and the headmaster of the school is a pastor. You know, he's uh, John Savage. I pray for him every day, and. Uh, he probably will have an opportunity to see that shirt and go, what? There's Hebrew. And, and then there's Yehusha's, his own words, you know, which is a, a witnessing tool, you know. And so they're light, you know, in, even in the midst of their school, you know. Is that why you wear uh, the Palaio letters on your shirt and on your car? Or on, do you find many people pull you up and who have done any kind of study and say, I know what those symbols are? You've you're got the creator's name there. A lady t was at the grocery. We were together, and it was a couple or three uh, Yom Shishis ago, you know, preparation day. And we were stepping out of the car, and it was actually more like two months ago, wasn't it? I don't even remember. Yeah, it was long. closer to two months ago. Anyway, we were going into the grocery, and this nice lady was standing there saying something to us about it. She said, that license plate that you have, Y-H-W-H. -H. That's the name of the creator, isn't it? And we said, yes. And we had a little chat for a moment. I gave her a, a little card that, you know, invited her to our seminars. And uh, in fact, it was just yesterday, we were in line at a, at, a, at a shop and some people behind us were talking to us and they were talking loud. It was an older couple than we are, actually. And they were saying, <laughs> If you can imagine that. And then uh, the lady said, I'm always interested in how those people lived so many years back in the Old Testament. You know, after the flood, they started to get less and less. And I said, well, we study Torah, and we, we would, we'd we like to get together with you on that. And I handed a card to her husband. And they said, we go to Southeast, and which is right down the street from us. It's that, that same place. And... Uh, yeah, that was great, you know. So the witnessing goes on all the time. You have to be ready. You have to have your your card in your purse or your wallet and uh, or wear something that draws attention. And you could say, you know, if they say, what's, what's those tassels that you have there? What's going on there? Or they don't know what it is. They call them strings or whatever. I say, well, you know, that, I'm glad you asked. That's something to remind us of obeying the covenant, the, the commandments. You know, Deuteronomy 22, you know, Numbers 15. And uh, it's a great thing to know. Oh, I, somebody else was saying something the other day. Uh, one of the people, that I was in the store, and this young man I was talking to, uh, I said, you know, they don't even you know, know that they have to keep the commandments. It's, it's, you know, stealing is wrong, and working on the Sabbath is wrong and all that. And he said, you know, my parents always drilled the Ten Commandments into my head all the time. And, and I said, well, yeah, they're forever. And we got to chatting about it. We talked for like 15 minutes. 
And uh, he was actually coming in to look for a job. That's his real intention for being there. But he walked out with a, you know, a card and I don't know what else, you know. So he's, you know, hopefully going to change. It takes time. You have to plant seeds and, and then they grow. Yahuwah water, waters them. So as world-renowned authors, um, what uh, what's that done to your lifestyle? Do you find that in spite of all the day-to-day -day routines, are you finding people just rocking up on your door every day wanting to talk and have a meal and that sort of thing? Because, I mean, you've got books around the world. If, if anybody was traveling and they are going near Louisville and they believed this, they'd be coming to see Lou and Phyllis, wouldn't they? Oh, don't they? <laughs> People do call and they say they're coming by, but not as much as when, when we used to live at the islands. Um, that was one of the reasons we had to to move. Is we had we would we had one fellow that uh, traveled by bus all the way from California, hmm. and and he just knocked on our door and said, "I just came to see you because yeah. I just wanted to learn more." And um, we had, of course, we. He had no place. We gave him a place to stay the night, and he didn't have money to get a bus ride back. So, we put him to work and let him earn some money, so we could he could get on a bus and well, go what, back. But we, in order to get the money, we had to sell things that we had, <laughs> we, and then we did a the yard sale. Him. We had a yard sale, you know, where you put things out on the street and then let him sell them. They were our stuff, but we just didn't need it, you know. So we've got this stuff and. He's selling this stuff, and then he's got bus fare back. But yeah, yeah. we we use and you know, one time we had a fellow from prison write to us and said, "My buddy's getting out, and he's he's headed to see you as soon as he gets out." And we're like, "Boy, this this isn't going to stop. Just people just showing up yeah. at our doorstep." Well, you know? you know, we have a family. You know, uh, yeah. at that time we had the three grandchildren living with us. Yes, as well. we did. We had small you children know. living with we, us. Our family. lives were really really full. But, uh, of course, you know, I was working all the time, too, and, you know, we were trying to get the business of the, you know, the ministry itself going, you know, and when people are coming in and wanting you to talk with them for, you know, eight hours or whatever, it, the interruption can just, just stop everything, and if people call and say, well, where's my books? Oh, uh, well, I didn't uh, have time to put those in the, you know, uh, we, we have to travel to the post office and, you know, we can't just sit there and frozen with people, but if people do want to come and visit us, we never turn them down, you know, but we... Uh, but we try to meet them over there at the islands yeah, because, yeah. you know, we try to keep our private lives separate, you know, yeah. but um, there's, the, of course, our private life has been blasted all over the internet yeah, now, but yeah. we don't have a private life anymore. But well, that's okay. That's yeah. okay. You yeah, guys are still He's in charge. buffering everything. Yeah. You know, but yeah, when we lived at the islands, we had people drop in for lunch. Remember? Yeah, <laughs> they yeah. would just here we are. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'd feed them some lunch and send them yeah. on their way. <laughs> and we'd sit down at the table with them and you know, chat with them. Um, but you know, we only would be able to give them a half an hour to an hour, you know, of time. But you know, when people drop in on you like that, but you know, they're important. They're very important. It's just that. Uh, a lot of times I'd be at the store, though, you know, working and trying to keep the whole place going, you know. But, uh, you know, Yahushua's going to do something, I think, to change all this. But, uh, yeah. you know, he's given me the idea, though, of the kiosk. <laughs> and, uh, that's what I keep <laughs> holding on to. He keeps holding on to that know? so that he but can... Because I'd love to be able to do this more, giving my the best hours of my day to be able to get more written and sent out into the world. But. See, because we, we, we've always felt like Lou's going to be tied to that store until he's reached a certain number of people, or maybe there's somebody yet that, that you is going to send to that store that has to be, you know, yeah. there are people in ministry that right now that have met Lou through the store. Oh, yeah. and They're in they're, ministry, they're, and they walked in that store, and they talked to me face-to-face, and, you know, they got, a, 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 you know, like Priscilla and, uh, you know, when, in the book of Acts, if you read it, uh, you know, he took them to the side and said, well, let me just bring you up a little bit more finer <coughs> details. 
Yeah, you know, so you you can get a little bit more accuracy here, you know. Um, Aquila and Priscilla, I believe it was. So, so we kept thinking yeah. when when he sends enough people in, or yeah. whoever that one person is left. When that last person comes in, yeah. Then then yeah. Lou will be free from the store. Yeah. So it's yeah. his. It, it, it's 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 Lou's mission. That store is his mission. Yeah, it looks like it. His job right now, but with the kiosk. <laughs> Maybe he's, his job can be carried on. Well, I think he gave me the idea, though. Oh, did he? Yeah, I think Mark did. You know, because that shelf so you put up. We find down here that the things Yahuwah has given you to say are so fresh and so simple and yet powerful. Especially over the last couple of years, do you find that you have come closer in, and you have a... Just how important is your connection with Yahusha to you? Do you feel that what's been going on to you has been really just to try and squash that connection? Aside from all the excuses everybody makes, do you feel that there's something coming at you to try and stop your connection? To stop you saying and discovering what you're discovering? Well, to interrupt us, to interrupt us, to shut you up, to take up our time mm -hmm. to the point where we are always dwelling on something other than the thing we were sent to do yeah uh, we're not we're not going to defend ourselves you know we're just going to just keep well, doing the work so whatever the demonic forces want to intend to do will be impotent and we'll just keep plowing forward but we do have to spend yeah. a lot of time because yeah. and the only reason we spend time with people that that are being affected is because we care about the person not because we feel like we have to defend ourselves. Yeah, they're injured. But yeah. we care. Yeah. I had a woman call me the other day and ask me questions, and and I said, you know, you've been you've been hurt by this, and and I'm really sorry. I, I apologized to her that because she's been affected, and I said, you know, we're I'm being interrupted, and you're mm -hmm. being hurt, and it's a real shame. But yeah, I I I think you're right. Uh, it, it does seem to be something to try to distract us and get, us, get our eyes. But like Lou's always saying, we can't look at the storm. We have to look at Yahusha. Yeah, keep your eyes fixed on Yahusha. And, because if you turn and look at the storm, then you're going to sink into the waters. And, get, and you won't be able to walk on the water. You know. So do you feel that he's brought you a lot closer to himself? Oh, yeah. In the last year yeah. or so? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because mm -hmm. we rely on him more consciously than ever, you know, and we pray for the people that are being harmed, you know, mm -hmm. and, the, and the prayer is the armor. When we put on our armor, we are in prayer, and the prayer with him is the connection. And if you're constantly praying, and you're always in connection with him, and you know that he's in charge, that you're the servant, and he tells you what to do, then you're always going to be fine. He'll equip you. He'll enable you. It doesn't matter what, you know, we didn't prepare for what we were going to say today. He yeah. just, you know, talks to us and, and he, he speaks. And if we just get out of his way, as long as he's in charge of your, your whole mind and your, and your heart, you know, you have no uh, worries. It, you know, Lou's always been solid as a rock. He's always been... You know, the one that always keeps his, his side on, on our goal and what we've got to be working. I'm the weak one. I'm the one that gets hurt. I feel like I get battered and bashed, but it seems like I get caught. You know, I, people will call me up and say, you know, I've, I've had a word from Yahushua to share with you, and I've been called to tell you. And it seems like it happens to me because I probably need the nourishing more than, than Lou does, but... Yeah, I, I, I'm the one that gets calls and people will tell me this is the word from Yahusha. Mm -hmm. You know, like the fellow called the yeah. other day. He called and he sounded to me that he was speaking right for Yahusha. He yeah. he was telling us that he was just, it was a, just encouraging. He, he was just letting us know that we're just doing what we're supposed to be doing, when we're supposed to be doing it. So how do you find your relationship now? Oh, our our marriage. You, you, oh, our yeah. Marriage, oh, yeah. We we have our ups and downs like any other. She's the second best gift you who ever gave me. Yeah. You know what the first one is? His life, his blood, 
his life. He, well, he gave up his life for all of us. That's his gift to all humanity. But, uh, yeah, she's the second best gift that you has given me. And, Sister, you're in total remission now, are you? Oh, yes, from, from, my, from my cancer. Well, the, the yes. tumor is still there, but it's benign right now. It's yeah. not infected. Yeah, the infection is all gone. The cancer yeah. is all dead. It's just the, uh, I, I still have a tumor, but I think, I don't know if it's going to be with me or if he's going to miraculously heal that, but, you know, there's no pain. There's no infection. Everything's just, it's just sitting there like a little lump, but it's fine. And that was no medication and no surgery? Yes, sir. No medication, no Well, surgery, Yahuwah's just... guidance, uh, there was a sister that was giving her counseling, mm -hmm. you know. Right. What's her name? Lucinda Robinson. She's, yeah. um, we, you know, we sell a book that she wrote. And I was following the advice in the book, and then I emailed her and said, you know, I'm, I think I need a little bit more direct help with this. And, and she, um, you know, so she issued me, gave me some patient schedules, you know, a lot of product to take and then switch from this to this and with diet and with these herbs that she recommended we, we've taken care of you well you has used that to heal me you know and I think um, I'm, I'm sure that he he could have just healed me miraculously you know without having to go through that but I I also needed there are some other things I needed I needed to do a cleansing in my body because I had prayed to him because I was, you know, a little, weighed a little bit more than I wanted to. I was a little bit overweight and and I knew that it was, my weight was climbing and climbing. So I prayed to him and I said, I asked him, I said, you know, can you motivate me to lose weight? And then it was not, and, you know, and then this, this knot that was, it already existed at that point. And that's when that knot started hurting and aching and, and I went, wow, this has got my attention. And I tell you what, there's nothing that's going to motivate you to lose weight than getting yourself, you know, knowing that you've got a battle to fight with cancer. So he used that battle to motivate me to lose weight, to, to clean up my diet. I've, I've, I've changed permanently the, the, the diet that I'm going to be on, and I'll never go back to eating like I was because I, it out. It, I liked the taste of the food, but it made me feel yucky. And so now I'm healthier than I've ever been. And eating a lot more living food and getting your body chiseled. But uh, you gotta watch what, watch out what you ask for. Yeah. <laughs> you might, you might ask him for something. He might give you a cancer to, to do it. Well, he gives you the desires of your heart. And if he wants you to, to, uh, you know, learn something, then he will take you and say, well, I want to learn how to be patient. And that is a really rough road and, uh, or humble or whatever it is. But he gives you that desire first, and then he makes you go through these things. And I think that's what uh, we have going on. I prayed for humility and for him to cleanse my heart. And then what do I see? You know, you know, it's, because a pure heart is very, very important. It's critical. Mm. You know. Do you ever wonder why, uh, or ask you, why he didn't give you the understanding about the food that you have now? Because your last bout of cancer was a lot more traumatic for you, wasn't it? Yes, it was. But, you know, that was the beginning of the the search of that was the beginning of the road because I had no understanding about physical health or clean eating or anything like that and um, so when I lost my I, I had a total mastectomy and back then they were they were really brutal back then they thought that you had to take they had to remove lymph nodes now that they've discovered that it's better to leave the lymph nodes in because that actually helps fight the cancer but then that's when Lou and I started um, searching, and that led somewhat to the, the desire to have a health food shop and a mm -hmm. vegetarian restaurant is because we, we started learning about healthy eating. And, mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it takes a lot of discipline, you know. Yeah. And so we started taking fluorescence, you know, on a 
to try to keep from having cancer again. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to take um, chemotherapy, and I refused the chemotherapy because I, I saw that the other people that were in this group with us did everything the doctor said to do, and yet they still had cancer the second time. So I said, well, I can just not do what the doctor says and take my chances. So, but yeah, it's, you know, for 14 years, Lou and I have both have been studying nutrition and healthy eating, but, you know, it takes discipline. Hmm. So you found you've both become a lot more disciplined in your walk through the experiences you put through? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, we're uh, committed. I mean, we always were, but you just, you know, you grow. And if, if you're not growing, you're dying. You know. Yeah, yeah he's put us quite, through quite a few experiences. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he's uh, protected us, you know, through so many horrible storms and you need to up a things that. Oh. <laughs> well, I just want to. Just want to say how much we love you guys. We only the other day were talking about how we were before we came across fossilized customs. And when you take when you take all the human elements out of it, and you think, why did it come then? Mm. Uh, in in that in that place, you know. And at the end of it, you realise it was you were visited by you who are, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and he gave you something, and it literally felt like someone just dragging you out of the state we were in and um and he, he used you guys to do that well and we just feel so privileged to be able to work with you and and flow along and yeah look forward to more fresh stuff oh yeah yeah well and it's been lovely today just hearing about how you came together and about the love story it's all about love isn't it yeah, yeah it is it sure is <laughs> yeah it is well you know it, it it's never going to be smooth sailing you know yeah it's, it's we can expect like you were sh saying and sharing a few weeks ago about the parachute that we have on it's the purpose of the parachute the plane is going to crash and we need to be ready and uh we're happy we're happy through whatever it is and uh, joyful and knowing that the outcome is going to be seeing him and pl being pleasing to him you know mm -hmm. because we're uh it's not all about us. It's about the, the work that he's doing through his body. And uh, a lot of people have to get on board with that and stop fighting it and not resist it. Just say, we've just got to get this thing going and stop fighting among ourselves. You know? Oh, that's, that's, so, that's so... You know, and Paul reminded us that, that whatever is happening with you and, you know, even, and, and Lou and I told ourselves, whatever is happening is so bad that we, we have to think about the great joy that is to be ours. I mean, you know, joy I, I never heard of. Mm -hmm. I has not seen and ear has not heard mm -hmm. what Yahuwah is going to do with us in eternity. The per what he's prepared for those who love him. That, that was the yeah. thing. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't finish it. <laughs> and but. we have to show him that we love him too. We can't just feel it. We've got to to act it out, practice it, showing that we're that we're committed, you know, to him, and and it isn't just about us. It's to infect other people with that same spirit, his spirit, so that he can get into them, and uh, they can just submit to him and stop running that selfish life they used to have, because we were selfish just like everybody, and you know now we can say well. It's really about the people that we serve, you know, the people that, that don't know much, that we're serving them, you know, and getting that truth into them, you know, helping. Well, that's wonderful, brother and sister. It's been a pleasure spending time with you today. <laughs> well, it's been yeah, wonderful yeah, seeing you stories. and talking with you. <laughs> Thank you, brothers and sisters, for tuning into this special Torah Institute story today. Shalom. Take my name on your lip, guard my word in your grip, hear my voice in your day, put all hate and strife away, fill your lamp 
with my oil Fill my heart while you toil I am here with you now Every knee soon will bow So hear the call, a great and wondrous call Cause I came and died and rose again You're grafted in once more I'm the door to come out of the hall Springs of living water bubbling up within You hear the call, deep and endless love A gentle sweetness coming out of y'all It is time to come together Cause this love fest is the call You owe none but to love my child, you, I'm proud of Spread my joy and my will Pressing through evil's chill Hear my cry, hear the call Love's a goal, love is all People rise and people fall But how many hear the call and wondrous call Cause I came and died and rose again You're grafted in once more I'm the door to come out of the hall Springs of living water bubbling up within You hear the call Deep and endless love A gentle sweetness coming out of y'all It is time to come together Cause this love fest is the call Don't you know that I want your attention I am jealous, possessive of my sheep I have so much love and affection for you Will you love me? Will you worship me? It's just obedience, so hear the call A great and wondrous call Cause I came and died and rose again You're grafted in once more I'm the door to come out of the hall Springs of living water bubbling up within you Hear the call, deep and endless love A gentle sweetness coming out of y'all It is time to come together Cause this love fest is the call Oh, hear the call, that great and wondrous call Cause I came and died and rose again You're grafted in once more I'm the door to come out of the hole Springs of living water bubbling up within you Hear the call, deep and endless love A gentle sweetness coming out of y'all It is time to come together Cause this love fest is the call It's time to come together Cause this love fest is the call It is time to come together Cause this love fest is the Love fest is the call
Brothers and sisters, welcome to the Torah Institute. My name is Mark Davidson and today we're doing a very special biographical show on two people who have been used remarkably over the last 30 years in bringing the truth to so many homes across the globe. They have been pioneers in the Messianic movement and in particular the way of the Nazarene. Writing books, leading seminars and teaching from the highways and byways wherever they may find themselves. And despite great adversity and pressure, they are still pushing forward, hearing Yahushua's voice and pleading with his followers to come together and love one another. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege today to be chatting with Lou and Phyllis White. How are you guys? We're fine. Hi. Hello. Good to see you. So today, I, I think everybody would just like to hear how you came into this, where you met each other. Just a lovely story of Yahushua's love in your life. So where did, where did you both grow up? Well, in the same city. Uh, we do a little differently. And they need things that men don't need, but men are very insecure creatures, you know. We don't like to show <laughs> that, but we really are. And when we get the support and encouragement and love and dedication from our wives, then it just opens up a whole new world for our you know perceptions so that was happening so all these scriptures and that when, I had never read or I found later I were gonna, what she was doing what did you find yeah. to read oh she put something in my path that was a copy of the scriptures that I had never read any of I was about 35 years old and I opened up the, this big book into the middle and I saw this this writing, and I remember it was on the right-hand side of the page. It was uh, Isaiah, we know his name is Yeshayahu, but chapter 53. And this really split the universe wide open for me. I thought the book was talking to me. Because, <laughs> see, I'd been studying science, and that was, and I had just given up on it because I, I was just so frustrated with it. And then I closed the book up and I said, I've got to read every word of this. Now, it was the NIV, and I was, you know, unaware of the translations. But I opened it up to the preface, read the preface, and some paragraphs down I saw that they had removed the name. You're getting ahead but of yourself. I'm ahead of myself because when I first saw the copy of the book, there was something laying on top of it. And I thought, wait a minute, this is important. We can't have things sitting on top of this. So I ripped it off, and I felt this rage burning in me. And I was going, what's that? You know, because of this thing that was sitting on top of his word. And then he op he had me open it up to the preface, and I read the preface. No, you're getting ahead of yourself. I am? What did I you, do? You found in Isaiah that says, he, I hate divorce. Oh, I saw that too. That, that was in another place. That was place. because he's asking about our relationship. Yeah, that was in another place though. He, you, you found out but that he hates yes, divorce. Yes, I read, I would start after, that was after I started reading more scripture. Okay. I found out that I, I was asking everybody whether, you know, because we were talking about getting divorced and the word, you know, divorce shouldn't have even been in our vocabulary. But it was, and we were, and I was asking people, and everybody said, "Yes, you should you just get divorced." And I said, "Well, there's one person I haven't asked," and I asked Yahuwah. So I searched in His Word, and I found out that He hates divorce, and I and I had already received, an, in, you know, a partial filling, you know, even before I was, you know. Okay, so was that before you found you found that in the preface yes. first? See, yeah. I'm sorry. See, the first thing I'm that apologize. happened to me. I'm learning this for the first time. The first time. thing that happened to me in the same scene when I was first reading Yeshua 53, I saw that and I said, I know him. You know, I have always known him. And I w went to the preface and then he introduced himself to me because he, he showed me his name had been removed by these translators. And then my, my bones started to feel heat in them. And a rage started to burn in me over that. I was going, who do they think they are? And I, then that was the beginning. So everything I read, Louisville, Kentucky. And that's where we're at now. And, uh, you know, in, we're scattered. You know, we're here. Anyway, the, uh, the way I met Phyllis was I'd been going to high school. And uh, I started my musical career at basically at age 11. And that drew me to her because, see, we were 
link through the study of music. It was, uh, I was in fifth grade and I saw somebody that was amazing that had played in front of the group and my, my friend Bob, you know, at, the, at my business was a fifth grader with me and we watched these two brothers playing guitar who were our classmates and we were absolutely amazed. So Bob and I started to take guitar lessons at age 11. And then I was, uh, you know, pretty proficient with it. I was very dedicated. I practiced a lot. And uh, Bob did as well. And by the age of 12, we were both pretty proficient. We had just a year under our belt. And we started to play in little folk bands. And we were playing for the, high, the, the grade school that we were in. And the, uh, you know, and then by the time we uh, got to be, oh, I was, take, I was taking formal lessons, as, as was Bob. And then Phyllis came in after I became a, a teacher, and she was 16 and I was 17. You want to tell the story from there? Oh, I don't know. I, was, I begged my parents for guitar lessons because I thought that's what I wanted to do, and I walked into the Conservatory of Music and then was waiting for my guitar teacher to come out, and then I saw this most wonderful, beautiful, handsome boy I ever saw in my life. I mean, it was just like there was just fireworks going off, and I was so nervous. I, I didn't, I didn't get much of a guitar lesson that day, but anyway, it's it was just wonderful. Um, but then we got separated because he had to go into the service. And we sort of wrote back, I, I kept all his letters while he was in the Air Force. And um, I still get him out and read them. <laughs> yeah, I was in for four years. See, we only knew each other for a year and then or so. And, and I took her to a few band gigs, you know, that we had. And, you know, we were really into each other. I was too busy to date very many girls. I had dated one other girl. And that was it. And then, but even she only went to a band gig. It wasn't a real date, you know. But, uh, you know, Bob and I were really dedicated musicians. And then uh, I, I'd disappear into the Air Force for four years going here and there. And then I got out of the Air Force. And the first day that I came home, there was a letter. And it was from Phyllis saying, welcome home. And then it was basically we you know, got together and we said, well, yeah, let's get married. And we did. And uh, then we, st well, we were starting college. And uh, basically, we both went to college mm -hmm. after work. I got a job at a financial institution. She was working at, a, at the phone company and um, in the offices as an engineer. And, or not at first, but she got into the engineering department. And we were both eventually working in the same building. <laughs> yeah. uh, so she was saying Yeshua. Yes. You know, that that was, you know, my first understanding was Yeshua. And she also explained to me about how terrible Halloween was. She was crying. It was, everybody at work was dressed up in costume. I think I was too. I don't remember if I was or not. But she was actually crying because she said, if you only knew the nature of our Creator, and that's when she told me his name, Yahweh and Yeshua. And she said, if you only knew his nature and his commandments and what he's, he's taught us not, not to do, you would know how we were hurting him. And she went through the scriptures where it talked about not to pursue him in the ways of these pagan ways. At that point, Lou wasn't even at the level of Christianity as far as reading scripture or anything and Wilhelmina and I were praying for him day after day. Mm -hmm. You said at one point to Amy a few weeks ago you uh, your relationship had pretty much it, it was gone you you'd had it you were asking for a new <laughs> husband. That was right when our relationship was not good. It was at I, the bottom. Yeah. And and I told Wilhelmina I hated him. I wanted another husband. And she said, wait a minute, you can't hate your husband. You have to he's your husband. You have to love him as you would Yeshua. You know? And she she was a Yahusha and she said you have to love him as Yahushua because he is your head. And I said, oh, but I can't love him. She says, well, if you can't love him, then 
you love your enemies. If he's your enemy, then you have to love him. So there wasn't any way I was going to get out of loving my husband, whether he was my enemy or whether he was my head. And she just was holding me down with that scripture. And, you know, I know she was praying. And so one day I, 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 I asked Yahushua, I said, Father, I need a new husband. For, I need a new husband for me and a fa someone that will be a father to my son. And he told me that if I would humble myself and be submissive to my husband, the one that he gave me to be my husband, that he would give me a new husband. It didn't make any sense to me, I, but I did it. Mm -hmm. I just stepped out in faith, and I started to be... And how did that affect you when you saw me being submissive to you? I was and amazed. Obedient? Uh, it, it, it was uh, the very thing that men need is the support and encouragement and somebody to stand behind them instead of resisting them. And when I saw that happening, um, then I started to change. And, you know, and of course she was praying for me too, but Yahushua was softening my heart and I was opening up to her because of this and it's reflective you know because when one person is kind the other person eventually has to be kind as well I didn't know that I was being unkind but it was more or less more of an ignoring kind of relationship I was just so busy and preoccupied that she was perceiving it a different way and women think differently than men and feel I was working for a bank and she was working upstairs or downstairs I I think that, was it was after, that was after we got married. Yeah, after yeah. we were married, long after. Yeah. And for some almost 10 years, we were not even thinking yeah. about children. But then the children come along when I'm 31, she's 30, the first child. And uh, from there, you know, we just found out what life was really about, you know. <laughs> because we went to school for like seven years. We both graduated from college. But when we finished our college then we were wondering why haven't we had any children and we took preliminary testing to see mm -hmm. you know and we just basically gave up on children and then suddenly I got pregnant One. <laughs> and then what honey okay uh, okay mm -hmm. we were you know we weren't unbelievers but you know we were just not dedicated to anything I had never read scripture because I'd been raised in Catholicism and I mm -hmm. by the time I was 18 I was kind of over that not that I didn't believe I just I was very very programmed you know I had a lot of their teachings still in my head and I had been raised in Baptist Baptists. beliefs and yeah. had been baptized in mm -hmm. the name of Jet Yeshua's and and I had and I I had strong beliefs but pretty much like him we were both just kind of living for ourselves mm -hmm. Weren't selfish we? yeah just, just like everybody yeah. you know try, trying to get a get just trying ahead. to make just trying to make it a living and, uh, and then when well the next thing that happened was uh, we started to grow apart a, a bit because of the fact that I was working all the time you know trying to build you know the business up changing displays just working all the time as much as I could and then of course our firstborn uh, was the only child we had at that time was getting to be about, well, four years old or so, and um, one night I was reading him a, a book or reading him a story as he went to sleep, and he looked over at, at the other wall and he said, he was looking at a Christmas tree, and he said, Dad, what is that? It was beautiful, and I looked at the thing myself, it was the only light on in the room, and I said, you know, I don't really know what that is. But I've seen it all my life. But I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll find out what it is. And when I do, I'll let you know. And uh, by the way, I'm never going to lie to you. I told him, I said, I'm going to find out what things are. And, you know, and it was a couple of, well, a, a year, another year later or so, Phyllis had been going to a, a, a study, right? With Wilhelmina? Y yes, we, we were... We Wilhelmina was a Christian friend of mine that worked with you. that worked at South Central Bell, and but she was keeping the fact hidden that she knew his name, but she didn't share that with just everybody. And she was having Christian group studies where we studied scripture, and one day, the study had dwindled down to just me and her and one one other person, 
And she said, well, I'm going to share something with you that I don't tell everybody. And she told us his true name. And and what I, name was that? She actually.